we shall show them our signs on the furthest horizons and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Then God turned to the heaven when it was smoke. Do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were joined together, then we split them apart into many pieces. Praise be to God, Lord of the worlds. You've just seen a visual interpretation of the Big Bang, a theory of the creation of the universe widely accepted by scientists today. The words you heard were from the Quran, the holy book of Islam, recorded over 1,400 years ago. Quran is the heart and soul of Islam. Muslims believe it to be the wisdom of God revealed for all mankind through his prophet Muhammad. It would seem to make no sense to look for factual scientific information in a book that primarily offers spiritual and social guidance through revelation. Yet within the Quran are many verses containing descriptions of the physical world that are remarkably similar to those of modern science. These verses span a wide range of subjects from the vast workings of the universe to minute details of life on earth. Do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and earth were joined together, then we split them into many pieces and we got every living thing out of water. Surat al-Anbiya, verse 30. It is in the way the Quran approaches knowledge that it differs so much from modern science. The scientific approach is to isolate and analyze the specific whilst the Quranic revelation always refers to the specific in relation to and as part of the whole pattern of creation. Today, science can explain many of the complex interactions which maintain the cycle of life on our planet. It's well understood how insects, animals and wind carry pollen from the stamens of one plant to the ovules of another. This process of fertilization in plants nearly always depends on the existence of definite sexual characteristics, the male stamens and the female ovules. Common knowledge today, but at the time of the Quranic revelation, such detailed information was not widely known. Nevertheless, in the Quran we read, Of all fruits God placed on the earth, two of a pair. Surat Arad, verse 3. God is the one who sent water down from the sky, and thereby we brought forth pairs of plants, each separate from the other. Surat Taha, verse 53.
The Quran describes the particular in order to further man's understanding of the unity of all things and his place within creation. In the light of this, we should perhaps expect to discover that any detailed observation made in the Quran should accord with modern scientific facts. It was the discovery of this relationship within his own field that led Dr. Maurice Bukai to make a scientific study of the Quran. As a medical doctor, particularly attracted to natural sciences and physiology, I must confess that in 19... 72, when I read the Quran in the original text for the first time, these data concerning man were those which impressed me most. And in view of the state of knowledge in Prophet Muhammad's day, it is inconceivable that many of the statements in the Quran which are connected with signs could have been the work of any man. This film is based on the research made by Dr. Bukai and published in two books, The Bible, The Quran and Science, and What is the Origin of Man? Dr. Bukai's initial interest developed into a general study of all the scientific references in the Quran. He realized that to fully understand these references, he had to develop a grasp of many specialized scientific disciplines. As his study progressed, he found that every description of the material world in the Quran correlated with established scientific facts. It is therefore perfectly legitimate not only to regard the Quran as the expression of revelation, but also to award it a very special place on account of the guarantee of authenticity it provides and the presence in it of reflection which when studied today appear as a challenge to human explanation. How is it possible for a book recorded in the 7th century to preempt so much of today's hard-earned scientific information? To understand this we need to look at the nature of the Quranic revelation and examine its authenticity. Mecca in the Arabian Peninsula is the center of the Muslim world. Mecca has always been a holy place and was a center of pilgrimage long before the time of the Prophet Muhammad. It was here that Muhammad was born and grew up to become a highly respected member of the community and successful merchant trader. It was his habit to retreat to the nearby mountain of light for periods of meditation and contemplation. In the cave of Hira, at the age of 42, he received his first revelation on the 6th of August in the year 610. Read, in the name of your Lord who created, who created man from something which clings. Read, your Lord is the most noble, who taught by the pen, who taught man what he did not know. Surat Al-Alaq, verses 1 to 5. The revelations continued over a period of more than 20 years, up to the death of the Prophet in the year 632. The Prophet, being unable to read or write, called upon his literate companions and dictated to them, and so supervised the transcription and proper recording of the revelations. These fragments were later assembled as the Quran. Altogether, there are 114 surahs, or chapters, composed of more than 6,000 verses. Within 15 years of the Prophet's death, a final Quran had been compiled and authenticated by the Prophet's companions, who had been present with him throughout the revelations. This was achieved during the Caliphate of Uthman, at the town of Medina, where the Prophet is buried. When Muhammad brought his message to Mecca, many of the people turned against him and he was forced to flee with his followers. In Medina he was given refuge, and it was here that the first Muslim community was founded and Islam developed its social form. From that time the Quran has never changed, and the original meaning of the words has been preserved. The same Quran, word for word, and in its original language, Arabic, is used today across the Muslim world from Morocco to Malaysia.
تدعون من دون الله. For the Muslim, the Quran is the book of wisdom which guides every aspect of man's existence. Not only the individual's inner spiritual development, but also his outward behavior and the social life of the community. The form which governs all Islamic life is apparent in both the complex urban society of a city like Lahore in Pakistan and in the traditional village community. The foundation stone of any community, no matter how large or small, is the individual. It is the behavior of the individual which determines the social pattern, its strength or its weakness. There are many verses in the Quran which guide the individual's behavior and which deal with his responsibility towards others. In any Muslim community, whether urban or rural, this is learnt and understood from a very early age. <laughs> The Quran describes this individual responsibility as a trust that God has given to man. Implicit in this trust is a threefold responsibility to oneself, to others, and to the natural world. In this way, the individual sees himself as belonging, as a part of the whole rather than separate. <laughs> Through the reading of the Quran, even the most routine aspects of daily life are given meaning. The Quran was revealed 600 years before a Muslim scientist, Ibn Nafis, discovered the circulation of blood, and 1,000 years before William Harvey brought this understanding to Western science. Yet the process of digestion and the distribution of nutrients through the blood to the different organs and glands is described in this verse. Truly, in the cattle there is a lesson for you. We give you to drink from what is inside their bodies, coming from a conjunction between the contents of the intestine and the blood, a milk pure and pleasant to drink. Surat al-Nahr, verse 66. No, no. <laughs> By accepting responsibility for his life, the individual becomes strong. From his sense of identity and belonging grows the strength of the village community, and from this, the strength of the larger community of the world.
أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا أشهد أن محمد. The Quran is, of course, far more than a guide to social and moral behavior. The acceptance of revelation essentially means believing in God the Creator. It also means believing in His prophets. For the Quran is quite literally regarded as the word of God. It's well known that a Muslim prays five times a day, but less often understood that his prayer shouldn't end as he leaves the mosque, but should be carried with him, coloring the awareness with which he undertakes all his daily activities, no matter how mundane they might appear to be. In this way, he attempts to maintain a perspective on his mortality and to live in the world, but not be of it. Today, there are more than one billion Muslims in the world, living in many different countries, divided by language, culture, and politics, but joined together through their common belief in God and the teachings of the Quran. And this in an age when many people, particularly in the West, feel that scientific progress has cast irrefutable doubt on the value of spiritual teachings. Islam itself has never considered that there is any real contradiction between science and religion. The late Professor Ismail Faruqi was a highly respected authority on Islamic studies. To be a Muslim is to be a scientist because you cannot be a Muslim if you if you uh, uh, if you do not fulfill the terms of the Khilafah. And the terms of the Khilafah are that you deal with nature, that you transform nature. Nature within you and nature in your human and other human beings and nature outside, the trees, the mountains, the rivers and everything. The whole of creation. So you've got to study nature in order to know its laws, its secrets as it were, in order to deal with it and transform it. Also, another reason, Nature is the creation of God and God subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has planted in nature his sunan, his patterns and therefore to discover the patterns of nature is to discover the sunan of Allah and therefore to glorify Allah and so there are these two reasons why every Muslim must be a scientist and this is why the Muslims have done wonders in science Therefore, the Muslim goes to nature not because nature is an enemy, like, for instance, the Greeks did. Uh, the Muslim goes to study nature not because there is a jinni in nature which he is trying to master or to subdue. Not at all. Uh, the Muslim goes to nature because nature is a gift from Allah, which Allah has made musakhar, that is to say, subservient to man, in order that man may live and may fulfill the commandments of Allah. By observing nature, man has always learned to adapt it to his needs. Ancient irrigation systems are a perfect example of man turning observation into practical knowledge. 
It isn't necessary to have a scientist's understanding of nature to develop such basic technology. In Europe, it was not until the 16th century that Bernard Palissy presented the first coherent description of the water cycle. He described how water evaporates from the oceans and cools to form clouds. The clouds move inland, where they rise, condense and fall as rain. The rain gathers in lakes and streams and flows back to the oceans in a continuous cycle. This picture is familiar to us today, but at the time of the Prophet, the prevalent ideas owed more to myth and speculation than to observed fact. In the 7th century BC, Thales of Miletus believed that surface spray from the oceans was picked up by the winds and carried inland to fall as rain. It was thought that the water returned to the ocean through a great abyss, which Plato called the Tartarus. Whereas Aristotle imagined that water vapor from the soil condensed in cool mountain caverns and formed underground lakes that fed springs. The Quran, far from reflecting the common misconceptions of the time, is in close agreement with the facts of modern hydrology. Have you not seen that God makes the clouds move gently, then joins them together, then makes them a heap? You see raindrops issuing from within them. Surat Anur, verse 43. It is God who sends the winds, and they raise the clouds. Then he spreads them in the sky as he wills breaking them into fragments until you see raindrops falling from within them. Then when he has made them reach those of his servants he wills, see how they rejoice. Even though before they received the rain, they were dumb with despair. Surat Arum, verse 48. is the study of the material world and of the way in which the processes of nature work. Spiritual teachings, as in the Quranic revelation, present an overview. Have you not seen that God sent water down from the sky and led it through sources in the ground? Then he caused sown fields of different colors to grow. Surat Azumar, verse 21. shows you the lightning by way both of fear and hope and he sends down rain from the sky and with it gives life to the earth after it is dead truly in that are signs for those who are wise surat arum verse 24 
The Quran asks man to look for signs within himself and on the horizons. To attain understanding, a man must use his eyes, his mind, and his heart. Any path of knowledge demands an act of faith, but not, as it is commonly misunderstood, blind faith. True seekers of knowledge expect their ideas and their faith in those ideas to be continually tested. In the short history of modern science, many ideas and concepts have been presented only to be discarded as new evidence points to a different truth. Nevertheless, there are many scientific discoveries that can be said to be undisputed facts. The fact that the sun is a direct source of light and the moon having no light of its own, merely a reflective body, is common knowledge today and accepted without question. 1400 years ago, such specific details were not commonly known. Yet in the Quran, moonlight is described as munir, a word meaning to borrow or to reflect. The sun is compared to a blazing lamp, wahaj, or a torch, siraj, a precise and accurate description of the difference between sunlight and moonlight. Blessed is the one who placed the constellation in heaven and placed therein a lamp and a moon giving light. Surat al-Furqan, verse 61. For a long time, European philosophers and scientists believed that the Earth stood still at the center of the universe, and every other planetary body, including the Sun, moved around it. In the West, this theory of geocentrism went unchallenged from the time of Ptolemy in the 2nd century BC right through until the 16th century when Copernicus asserted that it is the Earth which moves around the Sun. In 1609, the German astronomer Johannes Kepler published the Astronomia Nova in which he concluded that not only do the planets move in elliptical orbits around the Sun, but they also rotate upon their axes at irregular speeds. With this knowledge, it became possible for European scientists to explain correctly many of the mechanisms of our solar system, including the process of night and day. In describing the sequence of night and day, the Quran uses the Arabic verb kawara, which tells how the night winds or coils itself about the day and the day about the night. An image which fits perfectly with a cycle of night and day produced by the turning of the earth upon its axis. He makes the night enfold the day and the day enfold the night. Surat Azumar, verse 5. It is he who created the night and day and the sun and moon all the celestial bodies traveling in an orbit, each with its own motion. Surat al-Anbiya, verse 33. <laughs> Revelation goes much further than science in its unified vision of creation. Yet those aspects of it which specifically describe the material world agree with established scientific fact. Also, there is no observation in the Quran which is contradicted by scientific fact. عليك 
صلاه ربنا كل هين وآلك كلهم وما أنا ولا كان There is no genuine quarrel between the religious search for wisdom and the scientific search for truth. It is dogmatism that creates this illusory schism. Religious dogmatism leads to the denial of much genuine scientific discovery. Scientific dogmatism often arises through an inability to distinguish between fact and theory. Nowhere does this become more apparent than in the controversy surrounding the theory of evolution. For most of us, the concept of evolution conjures up the name Charles Darwin. Now, here's Charles Darwin, and we want to remember him because he's the first person to think of a convincing mechanism to explain how evolution might have occurred. He called this mechanism natural selection, and he described it in his book. Who remembers the name of his book? He wrote a book called The Origin of Species. Right. He sailed in the Pacific to a group of islands called the Galapagos on his ship. Does anyone remember? Yes? HMS Beagle, right. On the Galapagos Islands, Darwin found living proof of an evolutionary process at work. He found, for instance, that there were considerable variations in the beaks of finches, each having evolved to exploit a different ecological niche. But the variations all occurred within the same species. Darwin was unable to find any evidence to support his theory that one species could evolve into another. He expressed his misgivings in a letter written to Thomas Thornton in 1861. But I believe in natural selection, not because I can prove in any single case that it has changed one species into another, but because it groups and explains well, as it seems to me, a host of facts in classification, embryology, morphology, rudimentary organs, geological succession and distribution. Some apes. Yeah. Which one is some apes? Apes. Uh, apes. Despite his misgivings, Darwin's work had such a powerful impact that it has coloured most scientific research on a subject since. The popular image of evolution that mankind evolved from apes has been so widely embraced that it is now taught as being fact rather than theory. More than a century of scientific research has failed to prove this theory. For a long time, the major line of research was paleontology, the study of fossils. Here, very limited and random evidence has fed an almost unlimited amount of speculation. In 1971, Professor Grasset, who held the chair of evolutionary studies at the Sorbonne University in Paris for 30 years, wrote, In the history of the primates, we must be careful not to take at face value the reconstructions of our ancestors based on a few scanty vestiges that were put forward in all seriousness by highly imaginative paleontologists. This explains why genealogical trees of man are quickly devised and just as quickly discarded. The most recent works on the subject appear to be fairly mediocre, even though they concern new and interesting discoveries. The researchers engaged in these studies have neither the knowledge or the good sense to interpret the discoveries correctly. The fossil evidence has shown that there have been several stages in the development of mankind but a link joining any of these hominid forms to another animal lineage has never been found. The famous Piltdown Man hoax demonstrates the single-minded approach of paleontologists in seeking this speculative missing link. The 
oldest near complete fossil of a hominid form is Lucy, who's thought to be nearly three and a half million years old. The bone structure shows that Lucy walked upright on two legs like us, and not like an ape. Lucy and her kind, the Australopithecines, died out sometime during the first ice age. He created you in stages. Surat Nur, verse 14. Fossils found in Africa, Asia and Europe show that there was another wave of hominids, closer to our own size than Lucy, and with a brain capacity similar to modern man. This wave, Homo erectus, seems to have disappeared between 500,000 and 150,000 years ago. We created man according to the best organizational plan. Surat Atin, verse 4. The next wave, Neanderthal man, was even closer to us in structure and probably in appearance. He died out between 100,000 to 40,000 years ago. If God wills, he destroys you, and in your place appoints who he wills as successors, just as he brought you forth from the descendants of other peoples. Surat Anam, verse 133. Neanderthal man was overlapped and succeeded by the fourth wave, Cro-Magnon man, who is the direct ancestor of modern man. No clear link has been found between any of these different stages. In truth, we created them and strengthened all of them. And when we willed, we replaced them completely by people who were of the same kind. Surat Al-Insan, verse 28. Once again, the overview of the Quran and the facts discovered by research seem to match. But here the similarity stops. The Quran does not agree with the theories and speculations of the paleontologists. The latest support for the theory of evolution of species comes through molecular biology, in particular from the study of chromosomes and the genetic code. In multi-celled organisms, the complete genetic code is contained within the nucleus of each and every cell in the body. An individual inherits exact copies of genes from the parents, so passing on information from one generation to another. The only way a gene can change is through mutation during the duplication process. Geneticists have shown how this process of mutation can account for major physical changes within a short time span. But this is far from proving that one species can evolve into another. And it's even further from providing a complete explanation for the myriad life forms on this planet. Multi-celled organisms to change their nature and function, many different features have to evolve together. This needs fantastically complex genetic coordination. To attribute such coordination to random or chance mutation is a severe stretch of the imagination. Francis Crick, who's dominated the field of genetic research from the very beginning, acknowledges the severe limitations of the molecular approach. In one way, you could say all the genetic and molecular biological work of the last 60 years could be considered as a long interlude. 
Now that program has been completed, we have come full circle, back to the problems left behind unsolved. How does a wounded organism regenerate to exactly the same structure it had before? How does the egg form the organism? Almost nothing is known of the way genes communicate, cooperate and organize themselves to develop a complex organism like man. An attempt to explain life solely in terms of random molecular mechanisms is too simplistic. It fails to deal with the fundamental questions behind the process of creation. We created you, and thereupon we fashioned you. Thereupon we told the angels, bow down to Adam. Surat al-Araf, verse 11. The spiritual concept behind the creation of man from clay or earth is well known. Science has shown how there is also a physical reality in this statement. The chemical components which form the human body are present to a greater or lesser quantity in the ground. God is the one who created you, then fashioned you harmoniously and in due proportion. Into whatever form he willed, he made you out of components. Surat al infitar verses 7 and 8. The creation of mankind as a species can be seen in microcosm with the creation of each individual human being. The Quranic verses dealing with the fertilization and development of the human embryo are stunning in their clarity and precision. What you're seeing is the actual journey of the male sperm to the egg, photographed inside the body for the first time. God fashioned the two of a pair, the male and the female, from a small quantity of sperm when it is poured out. Surat Anajm, verses 45 and 46. Then we placed man as a small quantity of sperm in a safe lodging, firmly established. Surat Al Mu'minun, verse 13. fertilized, the egg moves to the womb, where it throws out villocytes, using them to cling to the wall of the uterus and to draw nourishment. Read, in the name of your Lord who fashioned, who fashioned man from something which clings. Surat al-Alaq, verses 1 and 2. We fashioned the thing which clings into a chewed lump of flesh, and we fashioned the chewed lump of flesh into bones, and we clothed the bones with intact flesh. Surat al Mu'minun, verse 14. As the embryo grows, it passes through stages where many of its parts are out of proportion. We fashioned you into something which clings, into a lump of flesh in proportion and out of proportion. Surat al Hajj, verse 5. God appointed for you the sense of hearing, sight, and all the internal organs. Surat al-Sajda, verse 9. Today, we are born into an age of great scientific accomplishment. We've learned about many of nature's infinitely complex mechanisms. When we think about the remarkable organization presiding over the birth and maintenance of life, it becomes less and less possible to consider it as the result of chance. As scientists delve deeper into cellular and subatomic worlds and outwards into mysteries of the universe, they reach new and baffling frontiers of knowledge. The classical mechanistic view of life ceases to work and scientists are confronted with questions that have traditionally been seen as belonging to the realm of spiritual and religious belief. It is certain that science, being a relative form of knowledge, will never be able to answer these questions. 
O assembly of jinns and men, if you can penetrate regions of the heavens and the earth, then penetrate them. You will never penetrate them, save with a power. Surat Ar-Rahman, verse 33. truly understood in terms of its interrelatedness and interdependence is the starting point of all religious and spiritual knowledge. The Quranic revelation is the most recent in a long tradition of revealed wisdom. It presents an overview within which all other ways of seeking knowledge, including science, can be guided towards a fuller, more complete understanding. The world is already seeing and suffering from the consequences of the lack of this unified vision.